if there's any success with this film, I'll donate it to a charity auction or something. But uh, I actually did come across one of the sweaters, and I thought, well, what was it? Okay. <laughs> now, uh, I'll ask this of both of you, and, uh, and I'll start the same with you. What, uh, how did you get involved with, the, with this picture? Chad and I, who wrote and directed it, had a mutual friend. Uh, and she sort of called me and said, you should audition for this. And uh, I, as an actor, I think we get that all the time. Like, email this person and something will happen. Um, but anyway, I did. And um, they brought me back to read with Richmond. And, yeah. and as for you, Richmond? They're, they're working on it. Working on it. I can talk really loud. <laughs> I, uh, oh, really? Should we just pass it back and forth? Maybe that's better. Here we um, go. So I, uh, I worked with Chad on a, my brother directed a film, and uh, they were doing a promotional tour, and they were going to do the premiere of the film in Santa Cruz, which was near where we bought a uh, shot. And, uh, <laughs> um, and Chad was shooting the promotional tour, so I met him on that tour. We, we went to Santa Cruz, and then we drove up to San Francisco, and then we flew up to Portland. And I got to know him, and became friends with him there. And uh, he said, I have you in mind. Same thing. He said, I have you in mind for this part. And I said, oh, thank you. Um, thank you guys so much for coming out. This is a really great turnout, and it's really hard to that scene with you two was so incredibly awkward. Um, Much like the drive here. <laughs> how did you guys approach that scene? Like, I know sometimes you know maybe you'll just go into it uh, dry without rehearsing it, so you don't know each other. Uh, did you guys rehearse ahead of time? Let's talk a little bit about that scene. Uh, we didn't rehearse. We met once before the uh, the shoot to kind of just talk about the scene with Chad. Um, the night before. Yeah. But it was, oh, yes, right. But it was a 14 page scene, so it was a, a lot to do, and we did it all in two days. Um, I, I think we just kind of sat down in it and just kind of let it go from there. It, I think the tension was kind of all in the writing already, so it, we didn't, kind of made our jobs a little bit easier. And is that, is that mostly the writing there? Did you guys improv any of that? or? Those are all the lines. She improv the scene, so if you need a DVD player, come down. <laughs> I remember that. But most of it was written. Yeah. And this was, this was actually shot in, in Reno? This was actually shot in Reno? Shot in Reno, yeah. What was Reno like for you guys? Uh, well, they put us up in a casino, so I lost money on this movie. <laughs> um, and, uh, you know, Chad... Uh, Chad has a really interesting history. One of the reasons that I was interested in doing this film was when I got to know him, he told me his history, which was that he was born in Cyprus because his parents were missionaries. And when he was about 12, he discovered that Variety tracked box office returns. And like a lot of little boys uh, follow sports statistics, he became obsessed with box office returns and went every week to the library in Cyprus and memorized them. And to this day, he can tell you what a film in the 70s made in today's money or the, the dollar of the day on the opening weekend. And it's very strange, but um, I found it really interesting. And although apparently I found it so interesting, I forgot what the question was. <laughs> Just keep oh, Reno. Kind of oh, I'm sorry, yeah. Okay, so the interesting part about Reno, the way that ties in is because every summer he went to Reno to stay with his mom's family. And uh, he said that until the age of 12, he thought that all of America was exactly like Reno. It was the only part he saw. And, and then the other part was that his mother's family is still there. So like the scene that where I have dinner with Steve, my mentor, and his wife, that was in one of Chad's family's house. And, driving around in her van. And, um, was it actually cold when you filmed it? Or? It was freezing. Okay. It was really cold. And one, uh, I'll tell you one quick interesting story was uh, when we shot the scene where I'm walking out from the prison, we didn't actually have a permit to shoot on that road. We had a permit to shoot on the highway that that road intersected with. So he had me run down to this sign 
that said, do not walk past this sign. And we started from there, and I'd walk up. And we did it about three times, really cold in the early morning. And then this, this uh, pickup truck came barreling out of the prison and just roared up to us. And was like, what, it, what are you guys doing? What is this guy doing? We showed him the permit. He said, well, that's great and everything, but this guy, and he pointed to my jacket, he said, that's the color our prisoners wear. And we've had a beat on him from the tower the entire time. <laughs> so I still wasn't sure we had gotten the shot. So I, while he was talking to him about the permit, I ran across to Sean, the DP, and I said, Sean, keep your camera rolling on me. And I went back to him. And I said, let me show you how far I went, and I ran down there, and I did it one more time. <laughs> the sacrifices you make for film, right? Uh, I know you guys always have some great questions as well, so if you, uh, if you have a question, just go ahead and raise your hand, and we'll start right over here. Uh, both of you, what was your impression uh, in reading the script, and what did the director tell you that this film was about? Um, when I first read it, uh, I... I've done a lot of theater, so what appealed to me about it was it's kind of similar, literally written as a play, um, and it, it was just so different than anything that I ever auditioned for, in that I had so much freedom to use the subtext and use the silences and the awkwardness and kind of, you know, explore in that, which is so fun for me. Um, sorry, what was the second part of the question? Uh, what did the director tell you that this film was really about? You know, Chad's a, Chad's a pretty quiet guy. Um, at this point, at that point, I didn't know him that well, and um, he didn't say much, to be honest with you. He kind of gave us a lot of freedom. I, I think, I don't know if it was different for you, but I asked him a hundred questions, and kind of every response was, whatever you want to do. So I was like, this is, a, you know, that's like a dream. Um, but I definitely, reading it, thought that it was something really unique and special. I, I, I was really excited when I, I read the script. I'm a, primarily a ca character actor or a day player, and in bigger films and on TV sometimes I guest star, but I play smaller parts, and a lot of times those parts function for the story, to further the story, like, well, I saw her here, in here at 7 o'clock, and I know that she called her fiancé, <laughs> but nobody's seen her since, you know, like... Uh, and this, and, and yet in acting classes, in scene study classes, you get all these rich scenes from plays and from movies that you get to really play. You don't often get this opportunity at my level, certainly. And uh, when I read the script, the first thing that struck me is, how do I play this guy? Like, what? I, like, I loved it right away. It changed a little bit, but I loved the script right away. But. Uh, I was kind of like, I, I recognized the opportunity for a rich internal life, and I, I was really excited about that. But the, ch the challenge was there, I guess that's the way to say it. The challenge was there, like, oh, wow, this is, am I going to be able to pull this off? Like, am I going to be able to go to where I need to go? And then, again, yeah, like Sam said, Chad didn't give me too much. He said that, he later said that he offered me this part and wrote it for me. But he then started to have doubts and wondering if I could do it. He liked the role that I played in my brother's film, which is a very different role. It's a super dim-witted sheriff in a sort of horror film comedy. And, uh, <laughs> and then he wrote this part of me. So he, he didn't, uh, he, t he told me later that he then began to have doubts. And he was like, oh my god, what if this guy can't do it? And I'm putting everything, uh, you know, the movie on this guy and what what am I going to do and and then when I auditioned I helped I did the readings for the auditions for the roles of Diana and the roles of uh, of Mark Bonner and uh, the role those two roles and uh, he said that he was reassured right then because he felt I was on point right from that audition um, he didn't say that much on set um, or if he did I, I can't really remember it I, you know we shot this from so many angles, the diner scene, that it actually took like a day and a half or two days. And, and the second day, we came in in the morning and I remember I was very, I didn't like the way, it was a new setup, it was coming from over here, and I didn't like the way everything was set up and we were being rushed into it where we had, had a whole day to be in this emotional state the day before. And I was really irritable and upset and uh, 
and maybe because of that, I, I went overly emotional to the point where I was like crying in, during that scene. And afterwards, I felt a little bit of like, okay, I got there. Let him, and he didn't use that stuff, and he held he held the performance back. And I think it's a much stronger performance because he did that. So his, I think he's sort of. His direction is is pretty minimal. He's pretty. Uh, he's he's. I've worked with a lot of directors, and I, I think he's a great director. I really think he's like a great director. He has all of it. The uh, the gentleman who plays Martin Bonner, his his name escapes me uh, right Paul now. Paul Thank you. Uh, he is so likable. Uh, the character is he in his real life persona? Is that is that what he brings to the screen, or is he different than that? Was he a bastard on the set? Like, uh, how was he? Um, the way I, I told, said it to Paul afterwards, I said, you know, he was like, people really love the character. And I was like, Paul, this is your best self. You should strive to be Martin Bonner all the time. And I hope that doesn't sound horrible. I hope that didn't sound horrible to him. Because he is like, well, there's, there's an endearing, lovable thing in his core. That's very, very likable. Um, yeah. yeah. More questions? Uh, let's go over here this time. Yes, sir. So, I mean, the director's not here right now, but I mean, do you know why he chose to tell this story? I know that his parents were missionaries, and that I know that his father at that age had relocated to get a new job uh, uh, with a similar type thing, and he began thinking about that would be an interesting movie. I've, I've been to about 10 film festivals with him now, so I can answer some of these questions on his behalf. And, and he said that uh, he thought that would be an interesting movie, and the more he thought about it, the more he thought of, of how few movies were out there about this age group and how that subject didn't seem to be tackled. And it is really relevant to America today, you know? And um, he also said that he was a lot gloomier about it when he thought about it than when he talked to his father on the phone and that his father actually had a full life and that he was starting to realize that for his father doing something like going to the auction and or you know was was a full experience for him where he would have found that dreadful um, he also wanted or has been very uh, specific about saying that he does call his father back and that he's closer to his daughter in the movie. You said at one point the script changed from when you saw it? Yeah. The, how, how so? I can't remember. Okay. Can't For remember. the better, though, obviously. Yeah. yeah okay. Yeah. Uh, more quite Yes, right up here. Hi, I'm the Palm Springs movie gal. Thank you for coming out. Thanks. Um, I, I liked the part in the film where the, the minister says, um, it's a good thing to look at people as people, not as things. And I thought that was really a, a bright part of the movie, a really nice part. Um, but I wanted to ask you about your family. You have a pretty rich acting family, brothers. And I have brothers and sisters that all sing and, and play, play you know, musical instruments. And we're all fighting on who did it first and who's better. and. All that well, kind I did of it stuff. Last. <laughs> <laughs> so, can you just explain what? It, uh, do you think it, there's a genetic thing in your family that to be art, artists and stuff like that? What's in the Arquette well water yeah. is what we want to know. Yeah. A lot of crazy. Um, <laughs> I don't think that it's any more genetic than anyone else. I'm of the belief that anybody can be an actor. That it happens to be the thing that. Okay, so. My great-grandparents were in vaudeville. My grandfather had a character named Charlie Weaver. His name was Cliff Arquette. He was on the radio for a long time on Fiddler Movie and Molly and some other shows. And then later he became... Oh, yeah. see, if any of you have uh, uh, what, Sirius or XM radio, Channel 82 plays radio shows all the time. It's great. And, uh, and I hear him on there sometimes, and it's really exciting. Um, and then my dad was an actor, and then... Uh, and my mom was when they met, and then my sister Rosanna was the first one to become an actor, and she's four years older than me, so she's eight years older than Patricia. And um, and then Patricia became had decided at a young age that she wanted to be an actor, and I was absolutely opposed to it. I wanted nothing to do with it. I remember I was older than the younger ones, and I remembered the lean times, and there were a lot of really lean, hungry times, and. Uh, 
I was very opposed to it, so I was the last one to get into it. Um, but the reason I got into it, well, the first reason I got into it was all the wrong reasons. I was living with a girlfriend and she kept saying, why are we living like this? Look at your family. And I thought, money. Yeah, she's right. And then she and I broke up and I thought, money and girls. And, and, uh, but I was actually scared. Once I acknowledged the possibility, it really scared me. So I took a, uh, an acting class at City College and I didn't tell anyone, including my family. And, uh, and I, I found I, I, had, I could do it, and, and it was exciting and, and scary. And, and, then, uh, and then I told my sister, Patricia, and she said, well, I'm going to see this teacher, Roy London, and uh, I'm, he's going to maybe coach me, and you're welcome to come along and audit his class. So I went with him, and we walked into this room that was about half the size of this room with these bleachers, and everything was painted black. There were several actors that I recognized. I was completely intimidated. There was a scene list on the wall. Uh, I thought, what am I doing here? I'm such a fraud. This is, I, I was sweating profusely. It was like, I, when Roy introduced himself, I was like, oh, he recognizes my sister and he's being kind to me out of pity. And, <laughs> and then I started listening to his notes and his notes were so beautiful. And he started articulating these thoughts that had been banging around in my head that I had never heard anybody speak. And I had, you know, being so, like, defensive against acting, coming from this acting family, and I had always gone with the, oh, acting's lying and all this stuff. And he talked about, he would never use, the, Roy would never use the word truth, but he talked about coming toward acting with a kind of integrity of trying to bring your own life to the work and work something out in your own life so that you're actually having an actual experience with another human being instead of playing the role of someone. Because who wants to watch someone pretending to be something? If they can, if you can actually watch. I mean, if you see a couple in the mall, argue, I just saw it. I just actually saw it. I saw this. I, I was checking my phone. I looked up. This beautiful young girl was sitting there. At first, I thought she was on her phone, and then I realized she was crying. And I said, "Are you okay?" And, and she said, "Yeah." And then this other sweet girl walked over to her and said, "Are you okay?" And sat down next to her. It was really touching. And then this guy came out, and he was like. What? I, you walked away from me. I, 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 I can get my own ride home. And the thing that was so compelling was that they were in a public space, but it was their hearts were so important to them, and their needs were so important to them that it was absolutely fascinating to watch. And I felt such empathy. And, and, and should I do anything? And should I just sit? You know what I mean? Like all these things. So if I could have bring up those kind of feelings in another human being because I'm actually having an experience, which playing with Sam was so easy to do because I don't have children. And all I had to do was look at this girl and go, what if this were my daughter and I hadn't seen her for 12 years? And I felt like such a screw up about that. Really easy to get, in, get into that. And then from that, I could then go into like, what would I need with, from her that relates to something I need from in life, you know? I'm just excited that the inspiration for your next role may come from the food court at the West Coast. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I'm excited about. Uh, we have time for a few more questions. Uh, let's go, we're gonna go to the very, very back. Yes. Uh, you yeah, just put your hand I actually have two, but I'll, I'll start off. Sam, I'm, um, I'm curious about your your role and the, the way you played No, no, um, you're actually right on. Um, my training comes from uh, Stella Adler, but there's a lot of writing about background and backstory. So um, basically the months leading up to the shoot, I was just kind of writing all the time. Um, and you think about kind of all the experiences you or I've had in my own life as a kid that I remember. Um, and I kind of just journaled about all of these times that he had uh, let me down or not showed up or made a fool of himself, embarrassed me, you know, all these kind of things that I could draw from so that when we did get to shooting and I sat down next to him, and he's the loveliest man, so that was an extra challenge, but 
so that when I did sit down there, I just had a well to, to draw from. That makes sense. What was your second question? I, the second question was um, for, um, you, you had to play this part so stoically. I mean, how, how did you dial down I mean, I mean, did you have a model in mind for that? Or is that you? You talking to? Yes, you. you. How did I? I relate to Travis Holloway's uh, lack of understanding of how to get through the world. I don't think I'm alone in that. I think a lot of us walk through life feeling like, how is it that everybody else understands what's going on so much easier and more completely than I do? And did I miss a class? <laughs> so uh, I started there. And then I built into that, like, well, what if this guy, Paul Enorn, is the guy that can give me the answer to that? You know, and what if Sam Buchanan is the person that I can clean up my side of the street of my entire life with? All the opportunities I've missed, all the times I haven't shown up, you know? And then I just tried to hold it. Uh, more questions? We'll go right up here. Sorry. Hi, my name is Rob Simmons. I write the movie page for the CV Weekly. Uh, I just have a couple of observations and a simple question. I can't think of, I can think of hard, I can't think of any other movie that seems to be about kindness. Mm -hmm. But while I was watching it, I had tremendous apprehension that something horrible <laughs> was going to happen. <laughs> and I, I it, it, the memorable scene for me is really when you're at the diner talking. I'll never forget it. Thank you my, so much. My question is just about the simple logistics of filming. Was it uh, DSL? Was it, it? Could you share the budget and how long the shoot was? It was the uh, the budget was forty two thousand dollars, including post production. Um, we shot over three weeks. There was one week where I've shot all my stuff without. Uh, Paul or Sam, then they brought in Paul and Sam when we shot a week of our stuff together, and then we left and they shot a week of Paul's stuff without us. Um, we shot in Reno, they got the rooms at Harris for free, they got uh, most of the locations for free. Several of the locations were not only free, but inhabited by, the auction was a real auction, the church service was a real church service, that, 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 uh, sermon that you mentioned, he didn't even tell them what to choose, what to say. Wow. Um, and they, we filmed the whole thing, and uh, um, I always feel like I'm going to burn up in a church anyway, so I, it was pretty easy for me. <laughs> but, I, I noticed uh, on Rotten Tomatoes, it's, right now it's rated at 92%. Oh, have, have you been to other screenings that had the same kind of reception? Uh, this is a really great reception. We, I've, this is the best reception that the they've ever had. It's so. really beautiful. It was really like, because I was wondering, like, is anyone going to be here? Like, and we didn't know, you know? And, uh, and we've been to certain f film festivals where there weren't a lot of people, and the Q&As were like seven people, you know? Is it, is it a challenge for you? Because, I mean, you say, you know, $42,000, that's catering one day on the Avengers. Uh, is it a challenge for you guys? Because, you know, a picture like this, I mean, Everybody here seems to have enjoyed it, uh, but it's a picture that, you know, gets, for lack of a better term, lost in the shuffle of everything else coming out. Uh, for, you, for you guys as actors to get the, the word out, I mean, you're working so much harder at it. Do you enjoy the work to get the, the word out, or, or how the process after you guys shot the film, more of the marketing, how's that been for you? It's the first time I've ever gone so far to try to get the word out on the film. Um, I'm incredibly humbled to be part of this film and grateful that Chad saw something in me. Uh, I turned down a, a call back last week for a, a horror movie that I went to the first audition and it was about this guy who abducts women and forces them into prostitution and the, the woman had like kidnapped him and was making him lead her to the other woman so I thought okay maybe there's some merit to this movie and then after that first audition I got the script and it was just more and more brutality and I just said you know I don't, 
I'm 50 years old. It's 2013. Fukushima is burning. The world is in grave, grave trouble. I don't need to work as an actor to do garbage. You know? I, I, so for this, I'm very happy. And I have, you know, I mean, there's lots of ways. And the other thing about this film is even if people don't hear about it, there's so many avenues for people to see content now. There's Netflix and there's video on demand and stuff. It will get seen. And it will get, I have to have faith that there's somebody else in charge and the people that need to see it will see it. You guys going to recommend it to everybody? Right. Let's now, we have time for two more questions. So let's make sure they're fantastic. In the very, very back, I believe you're like in a pinkish shirt. Hey, red. Red. I, it's a far distance. It's dark. I heard he's kind of a jerk, though. I, uh, no, he's not no, a jerk. I'm kidding. It's a joke from Joe Morelli. If everyone earlier. here liked it, like I will, I'm going to go home and I'm going to go on um, the internet and, and put down there that I recommend this movie. Thank and you. And that's what comes out of these. Yes. Thank you. 93%. Can I just say that, that that song he was dancing to is actually him in his band when he was 17? <laughs> Is that you, your picture, too? And that's my picture in high school. <laughs> now, uh, we've got time for one last question, and this is always the best question of the night. So, oh. Oh, We should just really quickly mention that the music is a fellow named uh, Keegan DeWitt, who's phenomenally talented. And if you go on uh, martinbonner.com, you can actually download the whole soundtrack, I believe. Yeah, and a really quick thing about what he did about that. He did this really interesting thing where he wrote this score for the movie, then he put it on a tape and he played it and played it and played it till it eroded. And then he put in parts of the movie like parts of the song, but it was so eroded. Like, mm -hmm. And you wouldn't hear it. And then it becomes full, like when she's on the bus, like that's when you hear the whole score. It's really beautiful. Uh, last question, last question time. We'll go right up front. Uh, to me, one of the unique things about the movie was the periods of scenery where there was no action involved with people. And I have my own ideas about why you did it, but I wondered if you could address that. I'll repeat the question is about scenery uh, in the uh, in the film. Um, you mean like the scene where I'm, I come out with the coffee and it goes all the way around and looks at everything? That was pretty cool. Like, I know that he had that shot in mind before then, before then, and I know that he wanted to find the beauty of Reno, the solitary beauty there, even though it, the film sort of kind of talks about the alienation of people there too, yeah. you know. But he wanted to show the beauty of, amidst that. So he was very specific about that. And he and um, Sean, the DP, worked very closely together and have known each other for a lot of years. So, When the camera's panning around, are you goofing off? No. I was just watching them. They're all walking in a little circle. Uh, before we leave, I'm just curious. You guys got something that, uh, that you're working on you want to talk about? or? Uh, I actually got an opportunity from somebody that had seen this movie. Um, so I'm going to North Carolina to shoot something called The Lost Colony, which will probably try to go the same route as Martin Bonner, just a little independent film. Very cool, very cool. Richmond? Um, no, I really have nothing. I did a short film yesterday, a little part in a short film, but I don't. Apparently turned down on my next gig. So. <laughs> well, I do have a little. Can I? And you can a little do whatever story. you'd like to do. So I want to just tell a quick story about Roy London, this teacher that I worked with who passed away and he was such a beautiful man and <clears throat> it uh I feel like I keep thinking about when I think about this film and the making of this film I think about him a lot and I think about how much uh he helped me and how much I grew through knowing him and he used to say that when he taught us, he would say, there's three kinds of scenes, and you have to figure out what kind of scene they are. And the rarest of them are death scenes. There are death scenes. that, you, But the other two are they're either love scenes or power scenes. And then he uh, would work with us, and he was just such a great teacher, and he worked differently with each person. And with me, I wanted him to beat me up, but he was always... Uh, 
so loving and gentle with me. You know, I would try to anta antagonize him. And say, look, oh, I wasn't thinking that. I wasn't doing that. And he'd be like, oh, I guess I was wrong. Like, no, you weren't wrong. You know, right? <laughs> but the story I wanted to tell is uh, that he died, and when he was dying, all these people, and there's a film about him called Special Thanks to Roy London, which I'm about to ruin right now, because I'm going to tell you the end of the film, but it's, it's so worth it. Um, he was dying, and he, he was dying of AIDS, and he was dying for a long time, and his closest students and friends were coming with him, and uh, his last words were, one of his students was there with him, and he was in a coma. And he said, and she was like, oh my God, he's coming to me. And he opened his eyes and he said, they're all love scenes. Aww. Well, we love the movie. We appreciate you guys coming out today. Sam Buchanan. Rich hey. Martin. This is Martin Bonner. Recommend it to everybody. See y'all out here tomorrow for what's happening with the school at 4.30.